and welcome to Mysteries Channel. I just want to say Happy New Year. I hope you have the best year ever. I hope I do too. And thank you for clicking on my video. Today's video is kind of, I don't know, it just kind of came about. I really wanted to do a video on the Black Knight Satellite. Fascinating stuff. I assure you I found nothing on the Black Knight Satellite. And so I don't remember what I typed in, but at some point while looking up satellites, I came across Admiral Byrd. I was like, well, he's an interesting fellow. What can I find out about him? Operation High Jump, I remembered that. I was excited to find notes on that. Didn't happen. Almost didn't find anything about Operation High Jump at all. I found two pieces of paper after really looking de decently on the CIA website that actually said Operation High Jump on it, so I know it was an operation for sure. The two pieces of paper, I will go over here in a second. Before we go into that, let's go over who is Admiral Byrd and what was going on during his life. Well, Admiral Byrd was kind of like a culture hero of his time, honestly. He was just the man's man, a person of adventure, and everybody was fascinated by all of his accounts, really. He was born Richard E. Byrd to a prominent family of Virginia, one of the very first families to get there. It is said that he is related to Pocahontas and that his family, there were plantation owners in there and they absolutely were involved in politics. So he grows up in Virginia, he gets married, he has children, he moves to Boston and he surrounds himself with the people of note of his time. He is all about adventure and rich people it seems like. People that he hung out with and appear to have been very Fairly close with are Franklin Roosevelt, Henry Ford, John D. Rockefeller, Vincent Astor, anybody else who was the who's who of that time kind of hung out and they were cool together. He uh, attended Virginia Military Institute and also the University of Virginia and then moved on to the Naval Academy. The ship he was assigned to was the USS Wyoming and that's where he begins being noticed. He receives commendations while he's on there and he is also given a silver life-saving medal. These acts that he does brings him closer and closer to high-ranking officers and he's starting to become I mean almost immediately he's become noticed. By 1960 Bird was medically retired from the Navy because of a foot injury he received and became a lieutenant and inspector of the Rhode Island Naval Militia. After the U.S. entered World War I, Byrd was recalled to active duty and assigned to the Naval Department Commission on Training Camp. By 1918, he qualifies as a naval aviator and takes over command of the Naval Air Station in Nova Scotia. After World War I, he receives a na another naval commendation. By 1925, Byrd commanded the aviation unit of the Arctic expedition of northern Greenland. Then in 1926, Bird and Floyd Bennett are the first to fly over the North Pole. They use a Fokker tri-motor plane named Josephine Ford after Edsel Ford's daughter because Ford helped fund the expedition. At this point, he hits hero status. He is 100% a national hero and he's becoming known all around the world. Upon returning home, Congress passes a special act to promote him to commander and both men receive the Tiffany Cross Medal of Honor. Like many great deeds, this one is surrounded in controversy, many casting doubt on his claim. The flight lasted 15 hours and 57 minutes, a total of 1,335 nautical miles. Some have theorized that he only made it 80% of the way. Some people think that he made it within 90 miles of the way, updrafts and, you know, a lot of math, I guess, a lot of funny math. Of course, I have no idea if he made it at all, but just being able to fly in that little plane that you see here, freaking 16 hours in the Arctic is enough to be called a badass. 1927 rolls around in an attempt to show the practicality of aeronautics. Bird attempted to do a transatlantic flight with U.S. mail on his plane, but due to the cloud cover over the landing area in France, he wasn't able to land. Starts going back out towards water where he thought he might possibly be able to land the plane and crashes. Doesn't matter. Everybody loves him. France sure as heck didn't care that he crashed and declared him a hero and invested him as an officer in the French Legion of Honor. In 1928, he begins his first expedition to the Antarctic. Now he's going south. Little America Base Camp is set up, is contracted, and expeditions begin. In 1929, the first flight to the South Pole is launched. Another trimotor plane is used, this time four people on the flight, which took 18 hours and 41 minutes. After this expedition, Byrd is promoted to the rank of Rear Admiral by another special act of Congress making him the youngest in the history of the U.S. Navy. 
On his second expedition in 1934, Admiral Byrd spends five months alone, at one point almost dying from carbon monoxide poisoning. In 1938, Admiral Byrd visits Hamburg, Germany, and is invited to participate in the 1938-1939 German Neuschwabischland Antarctic Expedition. He declines, even though the U.S. wasn't entered into World War II yet. Now, like I said, I look for high jump everywhere and found squat on it. So I don't have much to say about the operation itself. And that's okay, because I'll find it eventually and I'll do another video on it, dang it. What I did find is interesting and oh, I hate to do it, I hate to say it. It kind of casts like, I don't know, little red flags started popping up. What I found were a bunch of letters, letters between Admiral Byrd and someone that he appears extremely close with, not just in a work relationship type of way, but also almost a familial way, and that is Alan Dulles. Now, if you don't know who Alan Dulles is, let's go over it because whew, he's a interesting character as well. He was born in New York in 1839. He also comes from a family of politicians and lawyers. So, probably connected that way through family, honestly. Something that seems to go hand in hand. Anyway, back to Dulles. I'm going to skip over the pleasantries to say that he had a career in the State Department. He was known for helping expose the Prodigals of Zion as a forgery and persuaded the State Department to publicly denounce them. During the 1920s and early 1930s, he served as legal advisor to the Delegation of Arms Limitation at the League of Nations. There he had the opportunity to meet with Adolf Hitler, Benito Mussolini, and Soviet Minister Maxim, and the leaders of Britain and France. In 1935, Dulles returned from a business trip where he was in Germany, appalled by Nazi treatment of the German Jews. Despite his brother's objections, he led a movement within the law firm Sullivan and Cromwell to close the Berlin offices. As a result of Dulles's efforts, the Berlin office was closed and the firm ceased to conduct business in Nazi Germany. I guess there's that one. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dulles. Now, skip over to World War II. 1948 presidential elections, Dulles was, together with his brother, an advisor for Republican nominee Thomas Dewey. The Dulles brothers and James Forstall helped to form the Office of Policy Coordination. During 1949, he co-authored the Dulles-Jackson Korea Report, which was sharply critical of the Central Intelligence Agency, which had been established by the National Security Act of 1947. Partly as a result of the report, Truman named a new director of Central Intelligence, Lieutenant General Walter Bedell Smith. Director of Central Intelligence Smith recruited Dulles to oversee the agency's covert operations as deputy director for plans, uh, a position he held from January 4th of 1951. August 23rd of that very same year, Dulles was promoted to deputy director of Central Intelligence, second in the intelligence hierarchy. After the election of Dwight D. Eisenhower in 1952, Adele Smith shifted to the Department of State and Dulles became the first civilian director of Central Intelligence. Dulles is known by many things uh, as director of the CIA. Many good and many well not. Here are some of the most notable though. Operation Ajax, which is the coup d'etat of Iran. Operation PB Success, the coup d'etat of Guatemala. Implementation of MKUltra, the Bay of Pigs fiasco. After the Bay of Pigs fiasco in the autumn of 1961, Dulles and his crew, his entourage, are all forced to resign. And wouldn't you know, a few years later, a president is assassinated, President Kennedy. And I bet you wouldn't guess who was on the Warren Commission. It makes no logical sense at all, but that's right, it's Dulles. And I want to make it very clear why it makes no damn sense. It is Kennedy himself who forces Dulles to resign from the CIA him and his crew. So why they would pick the man who has something against him, hmm, it just stinks. On November 29th, 1963, Lyndon B. Johnson appoints Dulles as one of the seven commissioners of the Warren Commission to investigate the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. The appointment was later criticized by some historians, but others say that Dulles was put in that position so he could coach the commission on how to interview CIA witnesses because the CIA must have stopped existing when he got fired from it and they had nobody to spare to help the Warren Commission. At this point, I really only have one other quote and that is from Linda B. Johnson. Just get me elected and I'll give you a war. So now that we know both men, well, at least we know what they were known for. Let's go over some of the things I found. Okay, so I'm just going to go over a little bit of what I see. 
The first two things I'm going to show you are the only pieces where I actually found Operation High Jump written down. This is some type of biography for Arthur Lundell. He was born in Chicago, Illinois in 1915. He received his bachelor's degree in 1939 and his master's in 1942 from the University of Chicago in geology. World War II, Mr. Liddell served as a naval officer specialist in photographic intelligence in Alaska Aleutian area of the staff commanding the Staff Commander North Pacific Forces, where he was commended by Admiral Nimitz for his work. He was assigned to the Naval F Photographic Interpretation Center in 1945 and was later appointed the first chief of the newly formed photogrammetry department, I guess, which handled scores of Navy photogrammetric tasks, including spectacular problems with V-2 missiles, Operation Crossroads, Operation High Jump, etc. So there is High Jump. In September of 1949, Mr. Liddell was promoted to the position of the assistant engineer at PIC. In May of 1953, he joined the CIA. Next instance of High Jump is going to be in this one. Now, I'm not going to read the entire thing to you. It is interesting, and I will link it below. But basically, this guy that we talked about, how he's doing these photographs over this area, they are photographing the Russians, the Soviets, and what they are doing. This entire piece really speaks about Russia's actions, including the UK, Norway, and Japan, but mostly Russia, and mostly it's really just about the whaling industry. So as you're reading through, you're going to read about it, and it's going to talk about the Arctic Floating Laboratory, it's going to talk about the whaling industry and how these different nations are using the resources from Antarctica and the North. It's going to talk about what they believe the Russians have there. And then when you get down to paragraph two and you go down to section C of paragraph two, Oasis, is the third permanent Soviet base at present. On the coast, 224 miles from Mirny, it takes its name from the ice-free character of the 200-square-mile area in which it is situated. This unusual bit of exposed ground was first explored by Americans of the USN Operation High Jump in 1947. It was named Bunger Hills after one of the party. The only other mention of High Jump. We know that it exists. People have put it in here. We know what year it was, but for some reason, I just can't seem to find anything on the CIA website about it. Okay, the next article that I'm presenting, it's not an article. This is where I started to question things about Admiral Byrd. The letters I try to keep in chronological order. Let me just make sure really quick. Okay, so the, the letters are interesting to read because they're really well-written letters. It is interesting to see how people once spoke to one another, even in a professional manner. Okay, so this one, is dated, I believe, August 8th of 1953. Dear Admiral Byrd, Beetle Smith has sent me your letter to him dated August 4th, and I am deeply grateful to you for your very kind remarks about the agency, the recent attacks made on us, which I agree have been most unfortunate. However, to know that you are going to do all that you can to back us up at this time is most heartening, and I sincerely appreciate your actions. I am just off on a trip to Europe today and expect to return to Washington the first First week in September. Therefore, I would appreciate your letting me know when we will be coming to Washington after that time in order that we might arrange to meet and have a chat. I am sure you realize what this will mean to me personally and to the agency as a whole. Faithfully, Ellen Dulles. Okay, I believe this is a return letter. Dear Dick, Alan Dulles will be grateful for your offer of assistance, and I am transmitting your note to him. I agree that the attacks on CIA are unfortunate and that it is a wonderful organization. You know better than most that it is impossible to operate a secret service if there is to be outside attack on individual members. When an allegation is made, the chief of the secret service must be trusted to screen and control his own people. Both Alan Dulles and General Cabell are deserving of complete confidence. Thanks for your kind words about the German job. Interesting, the German job. We'll save that a little bit for later. I think we still have a big dividends coming from that project. It was good to hear from you, and too long since I have seen you. Faithfully, Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd. Dear Fidel, 
Will you please tell Alan Dulles that I'm going to do all that I can to help him with his problems? As you know, I am acquainted with many senators, and I have close friends who are close friends with senators. I also know some representatives quite well. I think these attacks on the CIA are unfortunate. There's this word that keeps getting thrown around by every single person. Unfortunate. Not untrue, just unfortunate. It is a wonderful organization, and the people should realize it, but secrecy is essential. If there is any special thing that you have in mind that I could do, let me know. The State Department has certainly done a grand job in Germany. Germany again. I still feel that the job of the administration is far more difficult than some of our leaders realize. I therefore think that every citizen should get behind the president and criticize only constructively. Harry is very fond of Secretary Humphrey and wants to help the president, so I know that he was sorry that he had to take the other side in the matter of increasing the national debt. I hope all is well with you, sincerely, and I honest to God cannot tell you, but these three are connected in the CIA database for Admiral Byrd, so the next ones we're going to go over are dated 1954. Dear Admiral Byrd, your very kind letter of June 8th arrived while I was out of town on a short trip, but I hasten to thank you for your expression of confidence and support. You know that the responsible people of the nation, such as you, are behind us in these troubled times is indeed a great comfort. It is reassuring to me that I know I can always count upon your help. With warm personal regards, faithfully, and I'm Fairly positive this one is from Dulles, although you really can't tell. But here on the side, there is something else. Dispatch via buck slip. I think that is a form of communication. I could be wrong. But it says, the director has asked that the attached letter to Admiral Byrd be personally delivered by the blank or whomever he may designate in order that this personal appreciation may be expressed to the Admiral for his offer of assistance. The director has also asked that at the time of, I think, delivery, we ask Admiral Byrd's views whether it might be possible for the Soviets to explode a nuclear bomb in the Arctic. It's hard to read because it looks like this part might be censored out, blanked out. Detection in short, there are areas in this location, blanked out, remote that such action could be accomplished. Go down further. Dear Mr. Dulles, this is also June 8th, 1954. Dear Mr. Dulles, I wish still again to offer you my services. Of course, since I wrote you last, I've been doing what I can to help. We know that no one is taking seriously anything said in criticism of the CIA. To talk about security risk in your organization would be absolutely ridiculous for two reasons. First, because you are there that... <laughs> I gotta laugh for a second. <laughs> okay, it's out. And second, it would be, <laughs> it would, it would, we know, be very bad indeed for the country both at home and abroad to start investigating the CIA. I just wanted you to know that we are for you and your splendid brother also. Can't really read what that says. I am glad that I am able to understand this statement regarding foreign policy. Your task, as everyone knows, is tremendously important. Success to you in every respect. The nation is back of you. With warm regards, sincerely, Richard Birds. That's an interesting statement to say the nation is back of you. Okay, on to the next. Dear Admiral Byrd, many thanks for your letter of the 1st of July. I especially appreciate your cooperation in the interview in Boston, a report of which I have read with great interest. One of the most heartening things about our work is the demonstrated willingness of each knowledgeable people as yourself in coming to our assistance when we need it. I would like to discuss with you personally some of the matters brought up in the interview. So when you are next in Washington, I hope you can find the time to sit down, chat a while. On arrival here, kindly call my office and arrange a time mutually agreeable. Sincerely, Alan Dulles, Director. Dear Mr. Dulles, your re representative called on me in connection with the question you wanted him to ask me, and I was very happy to do all that within my power to help him with facts, opinions, etc. I want you to know that I always stand ready to give you as much time as you need in connection with any matter with which I am, can be of service to you in your infinitely important task. I can particularly be of some help with Congress when some of our misguided politicians start talking about investigations, investigating your organization, which is above investigation. 
Say what, do? Don't take your most valuable time to answer this letter. Besides, I will be in Washington soon with warm personal regards and good luck with your great tasks. Sincerely, Richard Byrd. Just got to say this really quick. Above investigation. I know for a fact they believe that. In this, I'm not going to read it all to you. It just shows that the letter was transmitted and it just states, it doesn't say anything besides the fact that he offered his opinion on it. All right, on to the next. All right, dear Admiral Byrd, I greatly appreciate your letter of July 30th concerning the National Testimonial Scroll. It was indeed a privilege and an honor to sign that scroll, which is highly deserved. You have met a high mark in service to our country. Thank you for sending me the copy of National Geographic magazine containing your very excellent article on the Antarctic. Arctic. Your treatment, as always, is splendid. Sincerely, Alan Dulles. Dear Mr. Dulles, I've been meaning to write you for some time now to tell you how much it meant to me to see your name in the group of signatures affixed to the National Testimonial Scroll, which was recently represented to me. I don't think I deserve a tenth of your praise your testimonial gave me, but I'm human enough, I confess, to get a warm feeling from reading it and from scanning the impressive list of signatures. It makes me feel very proud and very humble. I'll never be able to express my gratitude adequately to you and to your co-signers of the testimonial, but as a very small token of my appreciation, I am sending you this copy of National National Geographic magazine containing an article on our recent Antarctic expedition. Sincerely, Richard Byrd. Now, what is the test? The National Testimonial Scroll? Hell if I know. I've been searching and searching and searching, and this might be the closest I got. I, I really have no idea what it is. I thought maybe it was a CIA reward, so I found these. These are different awards for valor in the CIA. The closest thing to the National Testimonial Scroll I found through browsing through all of this stuff is really going to be the National Security Cross for valor. But honestly, I threw this in there in case anyone was interested. Yeah, no. Don't know what the National Testimonial Scroll is. If anybody does, please please let me know. I don't know. I got to rush up on my uh, researching, obviously, because I was just like, what the heck is that? All right. And lastly, this is an article that was also in the CIA website. And this one is about Alan Dulles's sister. Most of his family was in politics, but this is his sister to leave the job at the State Department. Eleanor Lansing Dulles, Specialist Assistant to the Director of Intelligence and Research at the State Department, is retiring after nine years with the state. Mrs. Dulles, 66, is the sister of late Secretary of State John Foster Dulles and of Alan W. Dulles, former Central Intelligence Agency Director. She is the last of the famous Dulles family in government. A specialist on Germany. Germany again. Miss Dulles until recently was a specialist in economics as special assistant to the director of German affairs. She was in a large part responsible for the conclusion of the $3 million Berlin Conference Hall as the United States contributed to the 1957 International Building Exposition in Berlin. Her writings have covered many areas of foreign economic policy and reparations, and she is a strong opponent of a conciliatory attitude toward the Soviet Union over Berlin. Now, the next one that's attached to here, I can't freaking read it all, but it is obviously a shitstorm over Alan Dulles. Storm over ex-spy chief. Book is all wrong, says Dulles. I wish I could freaking read it, but I can't. If I ever come across a better copy of whatever this says, I will let you know. So in the end, that's really all I have on these guys. Obviously, Bird was very closely connected to the CIA. Makes me wonder if all the stories we heard about Operation High Jump were just the CIA's colorful way of misdirection. What bothers me the most, the red flags that I found, is how over and over and over again it is stated that the CIA is above investigation. Well, I'll do anything to help you. I know politicians. I know important people. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, Dulles. And then in the end, when you hear about all the things that Dulles is attached to, man, it's just kind of sucky. Anyway, tell me what you think. Did it bring a hero down in your eyes at all? Kind of did for me. I'm just like, what the heck? Anyway, thanks for watching.